and welcome to the Little Church World. My name is Simon Pierce. Today we are not recording in Hong Kong. We are in fact recording in Chelmsford in England, which is approximately one hour east of London. This here is my local church called Mege Church. Now before we start today's message, I have a question for you. How would you describe yourself? What do you think other people would say about you? You see, there's an epidemic in the world today, and that is self-doubt, low self-esteem, low confidence, and the feeling of worthlessness that millions of people feel every single day. And the result of this? It can result in self-harm, in the breakdown of relationships, loneliness, depression, and at worst, sometimes even suicide. You only have to type in Am I Ugly onto YouTube and over 570,000 videos, mostly of teenagers, come up asking the world, are they ugly? People so desperate to feel worth that they are willing to ask complete strangers if they think they're ugly or not. And what are most of the comments on these videos? Most are mean and disgusting comments, saying that they should be walking around with a bag over their head, or much worse. Now I have another question for you. What do you think God would say about you? God formed every hair on your head and made you perfect for the plans he has for you. If someone insults a painting, or they insult in the painting or the artist, God is the artist and we are his most beautiful painting. He loves us so much that he sent his only son to die for us so that we could be free from sin and death and have eternal life with him. Like in the parable of the lost coin in Luke 15, 8 to 10, God rejoices over everyone that repents, just like the woman who calls her friends and neighbours to rejoice after she finds her lost coin. We are God's most treasured possession. In Ephesians 1, 18, it says, I pray that the eyes of your heart might be enlightened in order that you know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. We are his glorious inheritance. This is what God will receive, his holy people. All of us are God's most treasured possession and we are his most glorious inheritance. And he has a plan for all of us. In Jeremiah 29, 11, it says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. How many of us think we may have heard from God, but don't think we're up to the task? How many of us have doubted God because we think we're not capable to do what he's asked us to do? How many of us have heard from God asking us to do something we really don't want to do that puts us really out of our comfort zone? I am one of those people and I'm sure there's many more watching this video right now. But we're not the only ones. Moses also had these doubts. The story of Moses begins in Exodus when he was born. It was a time after Joseph and his brothers had died and a new pharaoh came into power. And that pharaoh was very concerned by the number of Israelites in Egypt. He was worried that if there was a war and the Israelites took the opposition side, they would not only lose the war, but they would also lose their services and their slavery. So the pharaoh put out an order that every Israelite boy was killed at birth. Moses was born at this time, but his mother hid him but after three months, she could hide him no longer. So she put him in a basket and placed him amongst the reeds on the, on the river Nile. And then what happened? Well, the Pharaoh's daughter found Moses and took pity on him because she knew he was an Israelite boy. But instead of killing him, she took him to the palace and brought him up there. And nothing else is really said about Moses until he grew up. But that's when it starts to get interesting. When Moses grew up, he saw an Egyptian beating an Israelite slave. And what does Moses do? He kills the Egyptian and hides the body. 
They then find the body. So Moses runs away because the Pharaoh is trying to kill him. And then a very famous event happens in the Bible. God speaks to Moses in the burning bush. And what does God ask him to do? The last thing Moses wants to do. God asks him to go back to Egypt to speak to the Pharaoh and demands that the Israelites were given their, their freedom. Now you have to remember, the last time Moses was in Egypt, they were trying to kill him. And okay, it's a new Pharaoh on the throne, the proves Pharaoh had died, but he still must be in a terrified with the prospect of going back. And what was his reaction? Well, it wasn't exactly excitement or joy. In fact, he tried to persuade God that he had made a mistake. In Exodus 3.11, it says, But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to the Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Not exactly the words of a confident man. And what was God's response? At the start of Exodus 3.12, it simply says, And God said, I will be with you. But Moses is still not convinced. He is even concerned what the Israelites, his own people, will say to him. Moses said to God, What if the Israelites ask who sent me? What if they ask what is his name? What shall I tell them? And God tries to reassure him. In Exodus 3.14 it says, God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. But Moses still has his doubts. In Exodus 4.1, Moses says, What if they do not believe me or listen to me and say, The Lord did not appear to you? So what does God do with this lack of faith, doubtful and probably scared Moses? God gives Moses a sign to show the Israelites to prove that God has sent him. God told him to throw his staff on the floor and it turns into a snake. He then tells him to pick the snake up by the tail and it turns back into his staff. He then tells him to put his hand inside his cloak and when he pulls it out it's as white as snow like someone with leprosy. And then he tells him to put it inside his cloak again and when he pulls it out it's back to normal. But Moses still tries to persuade God not to send him. In Exodus 4.10 it says, Moses said to the Lord, Pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. And what was God's reply? The Lord said to him, Who gave human beings their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak and teach you what to say. In the end, Moses is running out of excuses and just asks, please not me. In Exodus 4.13, he simply says, but Moses said, pardon your servant, Lord, please send someone else. Now, understandably, at this point, God is getting rather tired of Moses' excuses. And in fact, verse 14, it says, the Lord's anger burned against Moses. And in the end, God just says to Moses, take your brother Aaron, he can speak well. So Moses and Aaron go to Egypt to speak to the Pharaoh. And not surprisingly, the Pharaoh doesn't listen. So then Moses brings the plagues of Egypt and in the end, the Pharaoh frees the Israelites from their slavery. But that is far from the end of the story. After they had left, the Pharaoh suddenly changes his mind. And in chapter 14, verse 5, it says, What have we done? We have let the Israelites go and lost their services. So then the Pharaoh chases after Moses and the Israelites with his army. And you have to remember, it wasn't just one man and his dog chasing them. In chapter 14, verse 7, it says, He took 600 of the best chariots, along with all the other chariots of Egypt, with officers all over them. 
And the Pharaoh caught up with Moses and the Israelites by the Red Sea. So there's Moses and the Israelites, stuck between the Red Sea and the, the Egyptian army charging at them. And what does Moses do? This one scared man that thought he wasn't even good enough to speak to the Pharaoh is now responsible to try and save thousands of lives from either being massacred or dragged back to Egypt into slavery. What does he do? He listens to God and does as he is told. In Exodus 14, 16, God says to Moses, Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so the Israelites can go through the sea on dry land. And after the Israelites had crossed the Red Sea and were safely on the other side, the waters went back to normal, drowning all the Egyptian army. And from that point on, Moses continued to carry out God's word and did many great things. He made water come from a rock when the Israelites were thirsty. He received the Ten Commandments and instructions regarding the tabernacle. And he made a bronze snake to heal people bitten by poisonous snakes. And then Moses died, in sight of the Promised Land, aged 120. In the beginning, Moses was a very unlikely hero. He had his faults. He lost his temper and killed someone, and then he ran away. He tried to make excuses for God's calling, and he thought he wasn't good enough. Yet in the end, God made him a great leader. A hero that freed the Israelites from slavery in Egypt and, most importantly of all, a faithful and obedient servant of God. To begin with, Moses had his struggles. He didn't want to return to Egypt. He didn't think he was good enough or that anyone would listen to him. And he doubted God's decision was the right one. Just like Moses, I have had my doubts. I have thought I'm not capable to do what God has asked me to do. God has really challenged me and put me out of my comfort zone. For many years when I was younger, I had speech therapy. And then when I went to university in my early 20s, I was diagnosed as severely dyslexic. And I still remember when I was six or seven, our headmistress was looking after our class. I assume because our normal teacher was either sick or on training. And she put sentences up on the board and asked each one in the class to read out the sentence. When it came to my turn, I couldn't read it. So she asked me again, and I still couldn't read it. And she seemed to ask me a hundred times, but I still couldn't read it. And I'm sure she didn't say these exact words, but it felt like she said to me, are oh, you stupid or something? Can't you read? Now, I was very upset with this, and when I got home, I told my mother, who then told my father, and before I knew it, my father was going to work late the next day to speak to the headmistress. And then later that day, the headmistress came and apologised to me in person. And I would love to say that that was the end of the story, but it really wasn't. Because ever since then, I've been terrified and scared of reading out loud and speaking in public. When I was college, in my teenage years, we all sat around a table and we had to read different sections of the textbook. And I was so terrified of this prospect, I used to work out which section I had to read and kept repeating it over and over and over again to make sure I could say all the words. I wasn't even listening to anyone else and my heart would be racing and my palms would be sweaty. But then, in 2011, when my wife and I was driving home after a week and away at a Christian festival, I heard God speak to me, and he said I had to do a sermon. Now, as you can imagine, I wasn't exactly thrilled with the idea. And initially I said, God, are you sure? Are you sure you've got the right person here? But he definitely said, you have to do a sermon. So reluctantly, I then spoke to our vicar, who agreed to let me do a sermon at our 7.30 evening service. Now, I wasn't exactly booed off, but it wasn't exactly the greatest sermon either. 
I think it lasted all of eight minutes, and I spoke so fast, I don't think anyone could understand what I was saying anyway. But you see, the goal for that sermon wasn't for it to be the best sermon ever. It was just for me to survive and not pass out due to lack of oxygen. A lot of us are like Moses. We all have doubts about our abilities. We all think we're not capable and due to this we shy away and try to hide. And we try to persuade God that he's made the wrong decision. Even though Moses killed someone and ran away, did God leave him and give up on him? No, he just gave him time. It doesn't how, matter how much you've messed up in your life, God will never leave you. It doesn't matter if you feel that you have no relationship with God or that you never feel him speaking to you. God is always there next to you, just waiting for you to speak to him. And he's willing to wait either until you are ready or your time has come to fulfill his plans. And let's remember what came of Moses. From a man of little faith and lots of self-doubt, he became a great leader and gave his people freedom. When he was by the Red Sea with the Egyptian army charging at him and the Israelites, what did he do? He listened to God and had the courage to step out in faith. He stretched his hand over the water and parted the Red Sea. But you see, you have to make the choice to take that step. You have to choose to step out in faith and to take a risk. Recently, during a sermon here at Meagate, the preacher prayed that God would search our hearts and tell us if there was anything that needed to be reshaped, redirected or go on another path. That night, I went up for prayer. And I felt God tell me that I had to see myself through my eyes. And what I mean by that is someone that's not very good at public speaking, not very clever, struggles with pronunciation and reading, not good enough, generally not as nice as people think I am, having no confidence and doesn't know enough, and see myself through his eyes, made perfect for the plans he has for me. And I would love to say that that changed my life. But when I went back to work and the normal routine on the Monday, I forgot all about it. But then, just a couple of weeks later, God spoke to me again when I was journaling. And this is what he said to me. I want you to see yourself through my eyes, not yours or the world. You are not perfect. You have done wrong, but that is why I have come. Look at yourself through my eyes and see the true you. By looking at yourself with a mirror, this can give a distorted and disfigured image of yourself. And when I heard that, I had an image of a funhouse mirror that makes you skinny or fat or all bent out of shape. Do not believe that this is the real you. I see the real you and you are beautiful and you are how you are meant to be because I made you. Again, do not see yourself through yours or anyone else's eyes but mine. Then you will see the truth. He has a plan for all of us. But to fully see that plan, we must look at ourselves through his eyes, not ours or anyone else's. We must not look at ourselves using the mirror, because that mirror might just be a funhouse mirror, which distorts our image. You see, as his child, you can and should love yourself, not in a selfish, self-centered way, but in a balanced, godly way that simply affirms the goodness of his creation. You're not who you are when you're weak. You're not who you are when you fail. You are not who you are when you sin. You are who you are through the eyes of God. You are not defined by your past, but by your purpose. Not by your circumstances, but by your calling. Not by your failure, but by your future. 
But don't expect God to reveal his whole plan for you in one go. When God spoke to Moses in the burning bush, he didn't mention anything about parting the Red Sea or the Ten Commandments. He just said, go to Egypt and speak to the Pharaoh. God is a bit like a sat -nap. He has your whole journey planned out for you, but he'll only tell you the next turning. God will only tell you that next little step because he doesn't want to scare you off. I don't know what God might be asking you to do. It might be to do something bold and asking you to show your faith and step out in courage. He might be asking you to give your life to him. Or he might just be asking you to find out more about him and start a relationship with him. Whatever it is, he will challenge you. He will put you out of your comfort zone. And he will ask you to do things that you think you're not capable to do. But whatever he asks you to do, do not see yourself through your eyes or anyone else's. See yourself through the eyes of God. Take that step and get ready for an amazing journey. If you would like to find out more about the Christian faith or have any questions, please feel free to email us at admin at the littlechurchworld.org. Thank you for listening and God bless.